Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. Part 1 When Mark and Jane arrived in Edinburgh, they discovered that Mark had left his camera on the train. At the lost and found office, he has to fill in a lost property form. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good evening, sir. Can I help you? Yeah, I think I left my camera on the train from London early today. Did you, sir? Oh, well. In that case, we'd better fill in a lost property form. Can you tell me your name? Yeah, it's Mark Adams. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, your address? You mean in Britain or in the States? Uh, how long are you staying? Oh, I've still got a few months in Britain. Okay, then. Can you give me your address here? Right. It's 21, uh -huh. Thames Drive, uh -huh. Lee on C. That's L-E-I-G-H uh -huh. on C, Essex. Uh -huh. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Do you want the phone number? Uh, yes, I'd better have that. OK, uh, 0702 35211. Thanks. And you say it was a camera. What make and model? It's a Rico. Rico. How do you spell that? R-I-C-O-H. Uh, OK, got that. Now, uh, you say it was the London train. Uh, what time did it arrive in Edinburgh? At 4.55 this afternoon. Exactly on time. Ah, uh, well then, if we find it, sir, shall we phone you? No, I think I'll drop in the day after tomorrow to check up. Ah, uh, right you are, sir. We'll do our best. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to two students talking about a presentation on time management. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, Mark. What are you doing? Hi, Lucy. Well, I, I'm preparing this seminar on time management. I'm supposed to do a presentation on the topic next week. Ironic, isn't it? I'm probably the worst student when it comes to time management. I don't think you're that bad compared to some other people I know. 
Do you need some help with it? Yeah. I just don't know where to start, to be honest. When are you doing the presentation? I'm supposed to hand in the draft on Wednesday at 11 a.m. The presentation is scheduled for 10 a.m. this Friday. That's not too bad. This gives you the whole weekend to prepare. Let's brainstorm some ideas, shall we? Do you want to get a pen and paper to jot down some thoughts? I think you should start with a broad general statement. For example, I read somewhere that organising time is a skill like learning to drive or tying your shoelaces. Then you could move on to discussing the common problems people have with managing time. That's not a bad idea. One of the common problems is putting things off. Yeah, you could also mention some common signs of this symptom, such as last-minute holiday shopping, pulling off visits to the doctors or the dentists. Another problem is relying too much on your memory and not writing things down. Do you mean not keeping a diary or a planner to plan the tasks? That's right. For example, writing down what I need to do in a diary or planner helps me remember what I need to do and makes me more focused on the tasks for the day. Good idea! Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. That reminds me of something I've been meaning to do for a while now. Anyway, I should also include some advice on how to deal with the problem, shouldn't I? Sure, you can talk about some ways of stopping procrastination. I guess making a to-do list can help one focus on what needs to be done. Definitely. Another way to deal with the problem is to prioritise and do the hardest job first, the one which requires the most effort and concentration. Also, my tutor recommended that I should break big projects into small parts with a specific goal. Having an action plan has worked for me. I usually make a list of small tasks I need to do to achieve a goal. Sometimes I just don't feel like getting down to work because a task seems too overwhelming for me to even think about. This technique helps me reduce psychological pressure. If I think of a project as a set of easily achievable tasks, don't you think? I know what you mean. I often feel like that myself with the statistics project I've been doing this term. I'm well behind and the deadline is next week. I think setting deadlines and sticking to them can help one to achieve goals. You can discuss this aspect in your presentation too. A good point. Setting deadlines can also help one become more realistic about the time it takes to do tasks. Another point you could include is how to deal with interruptions. OK. I guess blocking in time to handle unpredictable interruptions can help one stay focused. Not just that. Some interruptions, such as phone calls, can be easily avoided by using answering machines, for example. Saying no, which is one of the most useful words in English, is also very effective. It can be tough, sometimes, but you've got to learn to say it nicely but firmly. I think you've got enough ideas here to start with. Definitely. Thanks a lot for your help. I just need to type the ideas up and I think I'm all set. Do you think you can lend me your laptop for a couple of hours? Mmm, I'm afraid I can't. I've got to finish my own project. Never mind. I'll use one at the library. You certainly know how to say no. <laughs> Learned it the hard way. Got to go now. Good luck with the presentation. Cheers. See you later. That is the end of part two. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 3 As part of our lecture series on everyday health issues, today's talk is on tiredness. We shall look at the main issues in turn, as well as some of the main research that has been carried out in this field. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good morning. As part of our lecture series on everyday health issues, today's talk is on tiredness. We shall look at the main issues in turn, as well as some of the main research that has been carried out in this field. Firstly, it is clear that tiredness is on the rise. No official data exists on the rate of people reporting to doctors with recurring tiredness, but it's a very common complaint. Research suggests that people are not relaxing properly and often work when they do not have enough energy. Furthermore, products to boost energy are also on the rise. Sales of so-called energy drinks loaded with caffeine and sugar have grown by 23% over the last year. And this is not the only instance of an increase in products claiming to boost energy. Guarana, a herbal stimulant, can now be found in everything from chocolate bars to tea bags. Now let's examine what it is that's making people so tired. Dr Liebhold, a Sydney GP, has done extensive research into this and he believes that financial pressures, not taking holidays and not having time off when you become ill due to fear of losing your job are all common causes. Some of the other suggested causes are low oxygen levels in offices, poor diet or illness. The problem is that tiredness is a symptom of just about every kind of illness, which makes tracking down the cause all the more difficult. The next question to ask is, are people getting enough sleep? Dr Mansfield from Melbourne's Epworth Sleep Centre, who specialises in sleep disorders, says insomnia often arises when people are going through a stressful period. Mansfield often needs to re-educate people in how to get off to sleep. He recommends keeping your body clock regular by going to bed and rising at similar times every day and not drinking too much caffeine. And there is some truth in the old story about having a glass of hot milk before bed. Milk contains the amino acid tryptophan, which has been shown to help induce sleepiness. Turning to the question of why we need sleep, researchers are still trying to answer this fundamental question. Sleep deprivation experiments have shown that after 14 days without sleep, rats will lie down and die. And after only three days' sleep loss, humans get confused, forgetful and start having hallucinations. So whatever sleep does, it is important. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. However, not all researchers feel the same way. Trent Watson of the Dietitians Association is not convinced by McMahon's theory, explaining that our bodies don't really like to burn protein as a fuel, so it doesn't really contribute to energy levels. Carbohydrates, however, found in fruit, breads and pastas, are a more common fuel. 
Anyone following a rigidly high protein diet with low carbohydrates, even if they are operating at low intensity during the day, could subject themselves to fatigue because they just don't have the carbohydrate stores, Watson says. In general, a good way to stay energised from a dietary point of view is to eat red meat, green leafy vegetables, and whole grains. These foods give red blood cells the building blocks for optimum performance in their role of delivering oxygen to muscles. To sum up, tiredness is a health problem on the increase, and there continues to be much debate surrounding its causes and remedies. Now, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the process of fossilization. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The foremost exhibition in any great natural history museum is almost invariably a skeleton of a large dinosaur, often the famous Tyrannosaurus rex, or T-rex as it's usually known. Thus, one would think that these skeletons are plentiful, one for each museum, and more to spare in the basement. Well, here's an interesting fact. Almost every one of those T-Rex skeletons are just copies of the original fossils, and we only have 20 sets of these in the whole world. And the most complete is still missing one-fifth of its bones, and the rest are missing a lot more. And given that these dinosaurs once numbered in the thousands, and existed on this earth for perhaps three million years, you can realise an obvious fact Fossilization is actually an extremely rare occurrence. Fossilization can only occur when, after an animal dies, it is buried in soft mud or silt relatively quickly before the body completely rots or is torn to pieces by scavengers. Given this fact, the overwhelming majority of fossils are in marine sediment, where former marine life sank to the sea bottom, where sediment was being continually deposited. This means that we have a fairly good idea of the life in Earth's ancient oceans, but a much sketchier view of the land-based life forms. Fossilization on land needs water and mud, meaning that it is most often near ancient river sites and lakes. But it is still so rare that there are, in fact, large stretches of geological time about which we don't quite know what was happening at all. So, Given that fossilization is so rare, the natural question is, what can increase its odds? Well, fossilization mostly occurs with organisms which meet three basic criteria. One, they must have hard body parts, for example, shells, plates, bones and teeth. Unfortunately, the soft parts just rot away far too quickly to be fossilized. And I say unfortunately because it is often the soft fleshy features that most interest us. An elephant's trunk, for example, would not fossilise and from the skeleton alone we would never know the trunk was there. The second criterion for more likely fossilisation 
is that the organism in question must have existed in considerable numbers and be spread over a wide geographical range. This simply increases the statistical probability that one of them will one day be fossilised and hopefully found. Finally, and by the same logic, the species needs to have existed on the Earth for a long time, and the longer, the better. So, these are the three main criteria, but there are others. Being a large size, for example, helps us to notice and discover them as fossils more easily, and being a marine organism, as mentioned, helps also. Trilobites, a strange sort of ancient crab, are a perfect example. Their body structure was one of hard plates. They existed over virtually the whole world of their time and over a huge span of geological history, over 250 million years in fact, one of the longest ranges of any creature ever. Added to this, some species could grow to relatively large sizes and they lived in the sea. Perfect. These creatures meet all the criteria and as a result, museums all over the world are spilling over with trilobite fossils of all shapes and sizes. As far as fossils go, they are common. So, let's think about T. rex once again. It too basically meets all the criteria that we mentioned. It has hard parts, being the bones, had some dispersion, and had been around for a long time, although it cannot compare to trilobites in this respect. However, it does have one important advantage over trilobites. It is large, very large, which means we can discover it far more easily than many other fossils. And here's another advantage. Dinosaur hunters are a dedicated and fanatical breed, continually at work in all the likely sites of the world. Basically, us human beings are fascinated by these creatures. So much that we are always searching for them, probably more than any other types of fossil, meaning that more T-Rexes will inevitably spring up in the future, and one is certainly glad for this. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.